Coming up on Tech News today, I'm at home because I got to go catch a plane as soon as the show's over. We've got so much good stuff to talk about. Apple's going to overhaul iTunes about time. What exactly are they going to do, though? Microsoft knows who killed the start menu. You're going to be shocked by that revelation. And Google is bringing lots of apps to iOS. All that more coming up. Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Tech News Today is provided by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This is Tech News Today for Thursday, June 28th, 2012. Tech News Today is brought to you by Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. For a free trial and 10% off your first purchase on new accounts, go to Squarespace.com and use offer code TNT6. And they now offer free domain registration with annual plan subscriptions. And by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. If you're a media maker who needs stock video clips, photos, illustrations, music tracks, or sound effects, check out Pond5 for for instant downloads at the best prices anywhere. Check out Pond5 at Pond5.com. And for 25% off this month, use code TWIT25. Welcome to Tech News Today. I'm Tom Merritt. I'm Maya Zaktar. And I am Chad Johnson. Uh, Jason Howell at Google I.O. today. And I am at home trying to get closer to the airport. Uh, I'll be out tomorrow. But we're still going to keep you up to date on the most important stories in the world of tech, starting with the top 10 stories of the day in the news feuds. Day two of Google I.O. was on fire, like that intro featuring fewer announcements, but it did contain skydiving. The big news was Chrome coming to I.O.S., a Google Drive app also coming to I.O.S., and Google Word Docs getting offline editing. Chrome Books will now be sold in Best Buy in the U.S. and Dixon's in the U.K. And we were introduced to the Google Compute Engine, which was announced uh, in case you need 600,000 cores and some Linux virtual machines to rent. It all finished with Sergey Brin walking us through yesterday's skydiving stunt, including a second jump out of the Zeppelin. Bloomberg reports that Apple is going to overhaul iTunes by the end of the year. Now, iTunes will gain iCloud integration so users can manage and access their media on different devices. Apple is also working with music labels to allow people to let their friends listen to their songs for free. Changes to the iTunes store will also make it easier for people to find content. Oh, and Apple might be working on making separate desktop apps for podcasts and other features already in iTunes. Yeah, they, they do definitely have that podcasting app. The New Zealand Herald reports the case against Mega Uploads Kim.com just hit a snag. New Zealand High Court Judge Helen Winkleman ruled Thursday that the warrants used against .com did not adequately describe the offenses alleged. They use a general warrant. She also ruled the data confiscated should not have left New Zealand. Mega Upload will likely appear in Virginia's federal court Friday to argue that the charges should be tossed out. Now, yesterday, T-Mobile CEO Philip Hum resigned, saying he's going to spend more time with his family. Today, Hum decided he's sick of his family because he just took a job as the chief of Vodafone's Northern and Central Europe division. Hum starts his new gig in October. Mary Jo Foley talked about this on Windows Weekly as well, but she wrote on ZDNet this morning that Microsoft has shared some specifics about the Windows 8 upgrade path. And good news, everyone. Uh, Windows XP Service Pack 3 and Windows Vista users will get an upgrade path. It'll only keep your personal files, but it'll be an in-place upgrade if you want it. Windows Vista SP1 users get to keep files and settings. If you go from Windows 7 to an equivalent Windows 8 version, you'll get to keep your files, settings, and applications in most cases. And if you're going from 32-bit to 64-bit. Sorry, you out of luck. No upgrade path for that. RIM managed to surprise no one by disappointing everyone when it announced its quarterly, quarterly financials for its with its first operating loss since June 2003. The company lost $518 million on $2.8 billion in revenue, and revenue was down 33% compared to the prior quarter. And what will likely be devastating news for the company, RIM also announced that BlackBerry 10 devices will not launch until Q1 of 2013. Oh, yeah, and it's cutting 5,000 jobs. Yeah, it just keeps getting worse. Yeah. The CEA announced today that CES 2013's opening keynote will be held on the morning of January 8th and be delivered by Kazuhira Tsuga, the newly appointed president of Panasonic. That's a big keynote, but the bigger one is usually the pre-show keynote 
held the evening before the show opens. For 14 of the last 15 years, that slot, as you probably know, has been taken up by Microsoft, first by Bill Gates, later by Steve Ballmer. With Microsoft pulling out of CES next year, the buzziest of the keynote slots is still open. I'm going to put my hat in the race for that one. I would like to do I the have Xtar for keynote. Yes. Want to use Android apps on your Mac? Don't be blue. Try BlueStacks App Player. The application already available for Windows is now available for OS X in a public beta form. Now, right now, you can select from about 17 Android apps. I tried it out this morning, and it's a nice start. Do you think it's hard to figure out how to get just internet service from a cable company? Is that, does that bother yes. you sometimes? How? Yeah, well, the FCC agrees with you, especially when it comes to Comcast. The FCC imposed an $800,000 fine against Comcast for not adequately marketing its standalone broadband internet service, a condition of its merger with NBC Universal, by the way. In addition to the fine, Comcast must continue to offer its standalone internet service until at least February 21st, 2015, one year beyond the original requirement. Would you like to dance the tango? No. No. Okay, good. No. Because uh, maybe, maybe you could just download it. Uh, Nokia Lumia 710 and 800 users are I now receiving the Windows Phone update known as Tango, otherwise known as Windows Phone 7.5, which brings support for Wi-Fi tethering for up to five other devices. After the update's applied, those users can also pick up some new Nokia-exclusive apps, including camera extras, that brings features like Panorama and Self Timer. All right, uh, we're going to dig deeper into some discussions with John Strickland from the Tech Stuff Podcast in just a second. But I want to thank our sponsor for today's show, Squarespace.com, the fast and easy way to create a high-quality website or blog. I use it. I, was, I referenced it today. I'm doing an interview, and somebody said, how can I get a hold of your book, United Moon Colonies? I'm like, go to my Squarespace blog, unitedmooncolonies.squarespace.com. I did it that way because I wanted to be able to list every single way you could get the book in an easy to use format, something that I could update quickly and fast. I knew it would be reliable if, you know, maybe someday it got popular and, and a bunch of people went there at once. It, I wouldn't have to worry about hosting problems and dealing with servers. Squarespace takes care of all of that, and they make a great-looking website without hardly any effort on my part. I'm lazy. When it comes to web design, that's what Squarespace makes so easy. They have all these great templates to choose from. You can tweak the code if you want. They offer 24-7 support, and it's the best time ever to try a Squarespace uh, blog. I mean, you don't have to pay anything. Not even a, You don't even have to give them your credit card number to try it out. And then if you try to keep it right now, June, and there's not much June left, so you better hurry, <laughs> is one of the best times ever to sign up for a new account, especially annual plans that get you the best deal. One, Squarespace is offering free domain registration to all annual plan customers that's completely integrated with the sign-up process, and you keep the domain name. Even if you decide to leave Squarespace, they're, they're good at data portability. They're like, you get that. That domain name is yours. Squarespace also recently reduced its prices, now offering plans as low as $8 a month. And Squarespace still giving 10% off your first purchase on new accounts. Uh, that means 10% off the first month if you get a monthly plan or 10% off the entire first year. If you get an annual plan, so no excuse. You don't have to take our word for it. Go try it out. Squarespace.com. Just put in the name of a blog and get started. If you like it, don't forget to use our offer code TNT6 and get 10% off your first payment, whether it's monthly or yearly. Squarespace.com. We thank them for their support of Tech News Today. John Strickland, thanks for joining us today uh, from the How Stuff Works website, HowStuffWorks.com, and the Tech Stuff Podcast. Good to have you along, man. Good to be here. It's nice to see you again, Tom. Yeah, good to see you too. It's birthday week for us. It is birthday week. So happy birthday, Mr. Merritt. And back at you. Uh, awesome. well, let's start. Let's start with, uh, are you an iTunes user, John? Yes, I am. I do use iTunes. Well, uh, actually, I was going to tell us a little bit about the overhaul that's pending. Yeah, like, like I said in the, in the uh, news fuse, Bloomberg reports, there's going to be all new iTunes. Let's just go around the horn and go with each of these points and see what you guys think. Is, is, is this going to happen or not? Now, Apple's supposed to use iCloud file storage service with iTunes. So you're supposed to be able to manage your files through iTunes. You're going to take your music and be able to access it everywhere. Do, do we think iCloud integration is coming to, the, to iTunes right now? What do you think, uh, Jonathan? Uh, I think it would make perfect sense for iCloud to be uh, incorporated into iTunes like that. I mean, it, it Apple's starting to lag behind some other competitors like Google and Amazon in that in that sense. Without uh, integration, I don't see how uh, they can hope to maintain their dominance. Other than the fact that you know inertia is a hard thing to overcome. I'm always wondering how best to manage what I have in iCloud, how to check. 
to see what's up there. And and before you start telling me all you have to do is this, I know you can do all of those things, but it's Apple, right? And the Apple advantage is always I don't have to think about it. And with iCloud, I have to think about it. And And so I think this makes perfect sense that they would overhaul this in a way that makes it easier for you to see, okay, these are the clouds, these are the tunes that are in the cloud, these are the apps you have in the cloud, this is an easy way to scan through them. I mean, if anybody can make that easy to use, it should be Apple. I, I mean, I, I see why they would go with iCloud integration further, and it would bring them up to par with other services. But one of the things I have an issue with, just the iTunes software, it's kind of hard to use it because there's so much going on in there. And to find, okay, here are my iCloud settings, unless you can customize that left pane and be able to change things up, I don't know how to find things sometimes because it's either it's in the iTunes store, it's on my account, or it's over here. I just hope they fix, they fix that UI a little bit. I hope they change the whole thing and call it iCloud. The iTunes is, is for your music. That's a sep- that should be a separate thing. And then there should be an iCloud management piece of software. I don't think that's what they're going to do, but I wish that uh, that's what I wish they would do. And see, this this is part of the Bloomberg piece. I'm going to read this as a quote because this this is somewhat. It seems a little bit uh, iffy. It says Apple is creating separate applications for features that had been included within iTunes. Podcasts are now separate on on iPhone and iPad. So it it seems like th- those sentences suggest that Apple's working on separate desktop applications. Do, Jonathan, do you think that that Apple would be working on spinning out things like iTunes U and podcasts as a separate application for both Windows and Mac? I don't know if it would be a complete spinoff. It might be more of a, a a cloned approach where you have another way of getting at that material. Uh, it's a good question. Um, it's it's not something that I would have expected, uh, you know, a month ago. But um, I think if anyone can make it work, Apple would be able to do it. It's It's... I'm not sure if they're able to to give you like that that experience through each individual part of it or if people would just miss having everything all clumped together. Yeah, I'm, I'm thinking that Apple doesn't really seem to like to do a whole lot of different pieces of software for Windows right now. They have Safari, they have uh, they have iTunes, they have QuickTime, but I mean to separate it out and try to support all those different pieces seems a little strange. For OS X, I could see that happening because they're... Uh, Apple's been working very hard to make iOS features present in OS X. So why not do a similar approach that they're doing with their iOS things and spinning out these uh, these separate applications? Because then iTunes isn't as bloated and it's not as hard to find things. Uh, another another thing that uh, Bloomberg said, Apple's working on being able to share music with, between friends. That, to me, sounds like something they should have been able to do. I mean, they, they had contracts when they bought Lala. There should be ways to stream things. There should be lots of ways to do this. Is this a feature that Apple needs to have? Do they, do they really need to sh- share things, Tom? I don't know. They probably do. I'm the worst person to ask because I don't care a lick for this. I don't want to share music with friends over iTunes. That is that is not important to me in the least. But the social is a hot buzzword these days. And I think even Apple is not immune to that. Uh, and and, and they, they want to get people to be in the ecosystem, right? And this is a good way to do it. I mean, that goes all the way back to Zune and their squirting, trying to say, hey, we've we've got ways for you to share songs with each other. It's an old, old, old idea. It certainly wouldn't surprise me if they implemented it. Uh, and, and probably a few people will be excited about it, but not, not a big personal point scorer for me. And Jonathan, do you think that's more likely since uh, Apple's getting buddy-buddy with Facebook? They're going to be like, hey, look, you can share your music on Facebook. Well, I, I would say that if they were going to go with the social route, that's pretty much what they need to do. I mean, they've tried to bring social into iTunes before. And the problem is that people are already, they've already designated where their space is socially on the web. And it, it's not really that they want to look for more ways to be social. They want to integrate those ways into where they already are. And with Facebook already having relationships with Spotify, for example, uh, this is a little complicated. Uh, uh, I would like to see it because often I think of great songs that I would like to share and I would like other ways of doing it besides looking for an unauthorized YouTube clip of a song and posting that in Facebook. Uh, I would like to have more uh, legitimate ways of doing that so I don't feel like I'm somehow skirting copyright laws because I actually don't like doing that. All right. We have a murder to solve, Iaz. A murder, Microsoft you say? Microsoft has finally found out who's guilty of murdering the start menu in Windows 8. It's you. Just 
to Tanya Serene, Principal Program Manager at Microsoft, <laughs> told PC Pro at TechEd in Amsterdam, they dropped the start button in Windows 8 because nobody uses it. Uh, in fact, this is the quote. Uh, Telemetry obtained by the Microsoft Customer Experience Improvement Program found more users relying on the Windows taskbar for pinning and accessing their favorite software. Serene said, so I'm a desktop user. I pin the browser, explore whatever my apps are. I don't go to the start menu as often. If you're going to the start screen now, we're going to unlock a whole new set of scenarios, or you can choose not to go there. Stay in the desktop, and it's still fast. You can't beat the taskbar. John, do you buy this in Windows? Do you do? Are you one of the people who's like, you know what, I got keyboard shortcuts, because this is another thing she mentioned. I don't, I don't need the start menu. Every time I see something... Uh, about how people don't use a certain feature, I start to think I am the most marginalized person in the on the entire planet because I use the start all the start button all the time. I I mean I that's kind of how I access a lot of my my uh, programs and my applications. I don't like putting lots of short shortcuts on the desktop. I don't like pinning a lot of stuff to the taskbar. I like to have a pretty clean desktop, so I use the start menu all the time to go into the applications and and find what I need. I know how it's laid out. I know how to navigate it. It's very quick. And I honestly just never bothered to really learn all the different shortcuts because I just knew where everything was. So when I read this, I thought, wow, they, they must have pulled in a whole bunch of people who use Windows exactly the opposite way that I do. And now I'm going to suffer for it. I used to use the start button all the time. I mean, I would, or, and keyboard shortcuts. I mean, it's, it was just an easy way to find things. And on top of that, when Microsoft changed things up and it didn't have those fly out menus all the time, I would hit start and I would just start typing and that would find things. Now, that feature's still there in Windows 8. So I don't know if I necessarily need the start button because there's still that search, searchability. I think that as long as that function's still present and the fact that Microsoft didn't kill those keyboard shortcuts for keyboard junkies like me, you're not going to necessarily even notice the difference right away other than giant, massive tiles. <laughs> you know, they surveyed the Microsoft Customer Experience Improvement Program to find out this telemetry that showed them how people use it. My guess is there's a selection bias there uh, that the, the MCEIP, if that's the acronym, uh, probably has a bunch of people that use Windows in a certain way. It's not It's not a scientific sample, so... Maybe they figure, well, these are our most dedicated users and everybody else will adapt. Uh, I asked the chat room, it doesn't seem like anybody in there is a member of this program. And a lot of them are really complaining about this study. So I, I think Microsoft should take another look at putting that start menu back or, or, or making it a setting at the very least that you can turn on. Because a lot of people definitely do want it. And I don't know, maybe it is a negligible amount. Maybe we, me and John are the marginal people who pay our taxes on time and drive the speed limit and use the start button. And we're, the, we're not the norm. But I, I feel like this is something that's just going to keep nagging at Microsoft all the way through the launch of Windows 8 and beyond. I think it's smart that Microsoft doesn't give that option back either. Because, I mean, Microsoft at some point has to draw some lines and go, look, okay, if you like that, it's done with, okay? There's no more program manager. You don't have the, you don't have a file manager. We're just Explorer. Get over it. We're moving forward. This is the future. And so if, to marginalize you two, I guess that's just the uh, price that you got to pay. So the future right. is I don't know where anything is anymore. Yes. Well, you can I, search, I that though. You use to. the charm menu. Actually, it's not that bad, the charm thing on the right. It's, not, it's, it's pretty good. And maybe once I get used to that. That'll be and when they remove the charm menu, you'll complain in 10 years. And then I'll, I miss the charm menu. <laughs> I still uh, miss Clippy. <laughs> the uh, Google I.O. announcements today, uh, starting with what, what I think are probably the biggest announcements of the day. It was a much a much tighter day than it was yesterday where they're throwing everything in the kitchen sink at us and skydivers, which we did see again. Chrome coming to the iPhone and iPad. Yeah, so Chrome is available for both devices. I have one on my, I have Chrome on my iPad, and you can sign into your Google account. So it's got some cool features. So if you have a multi, another device open, let's say I have on my laptop here, the same tabs are accessible on Chrome, which is it's got some pretty neat things going on. But a couple of sites like Anontech checked out what's actually underneath the hood, and Google is stuck using Apple's developer tools, which means Chrome is kind of hamstrung. It's not a native app. It's using uh, iOS UI WebView, which means it's the same rendering engine as mobile Safari. It doesn't have access to mobile Safari's Nitro JavaScript engine, which means it's kind of it's just not going to run as fast as Safari. Now, in my not scientific tests, because I'm not as, as, as uh, skilled as the folks at Anontech, 
I was playing with it on the iPad, and it actually did seem to throw pages up faster than Safari did. Uh, and one of the things it does, if I can get this to show, is that when you switch tabs, instead of re-rendering right away, it actually shows like a black and white still, and then it re-renders it. So it, there's a feeling of it's not as slow. Uh, ha, ha, so that's they, pretty clever. They kind of trick you in that way, and there's a lot of features up front that you would have to go into. For Safari, you'd have to go into the settings. They're up front in Chrome. Like right here, there's the... There's a drop-down menu, right? Let me see if I can get that. Right there. So you can actually access a lot of your stuff right, uh, right into there. And I, I got to say, it works pretty well. It's very familiar. No bookmarks bar. So if you're a bookmarklet guy like me, you can't just, you can't just use this the way you normally would something like Pocket or Read Later. Uh, did, Tom, did you try it out? I did. I downloaded it. It downloaded fast. It seemed to work very well. Uh, the ability to move the tabs around it took me a second to catch on that you actually can slide all of them if you have multiple tabs that go off the window. And then if you want to move one to a different position, you kind of pull it down and around. Very elegant, though. I think it works great. Uh, it seems like Google may be doing some juicing of the of, of serving pages through Chrome. I, I'm interested if somebody digs under the hood and finds out if they're using uh, some, some way of proxying or something like that i'm not sure they are but i i like you found it to be very snappy uh and it's it's laboring under the same thing as everybody else where safari gets a version of java uh that they don't make available to any other application on the platform and so that hurts competitive browsers and i think chrome has done a pretty fine way of getting around all of those drawbacks john did you get a chance to mess with it uh, I don't. I can't seem to get Chrome to work on my iPod Classic uh, <laughs> because my wife has the iPad, so I don't uh -huh. have access to an iOS device that can run it. Uh, the only thing that – well, I mean I'm not surprised at all that you can't make Chrome the default browser. Uh, it is sort of a, a pain if you do rely on Chrome a lot and you keep forgetting if you ever try and open up a link and then you – oh, wait, that's right. I forgot if I try to open up the link, Safari is going to open, not Chrome. Um, but uh, it does sound like Google tried to, to get around some of the barriers that were put up in its way um, for, I guess, security purposes. That's what Apple always says, right? That's why yeah, other, yeah. other browsers can't have access. Um, I, I, I like the idea that, that Google has managed to, to skirt around this a little bit and that you are able to take advantage of things like the, the tab management and syncing across various uh, instances of Google, uh, Google Chrome because uh, I use it all the time for my research. And for me, it's really important to be able to pick up any of the devices I use regularly and be able to go directly to wherever it is that I need to in order to get the research that I've been conducting. And it, it's so nice to not have to remember what machine that was on. Yeah, I, I like the tab syncing as well. I mean, I use Chrome across, I got it on two devices right now. I've got it on my Windows desktop. I've got it on my MacBook Pro. Uh, having it on the tablet uh, is going to be fantastic. The one thing that I need it to do is be able to edit those Google Docs that we use to make our lineups the way I can edit it on a desktop. And I, we, we've got an update on Google Drive coming before we get to that, I want to thank our sponsor. Ayaz, any, any last thoughts on Chrome before we move on? Uh, well, at least it's, it's free. And the thing is, we saw that Google was working on the whole web browsing experience with its uh, Google Search app. I mean, it had a lot of functions that are similar to this. So I'm not surprised that Google went ahead and did this other than the fact that, yeah, you can't, I mean, you can't change the default unless you, I don't know, you jailbreak your device. And I don't know if it's going to steal users, but I know Apple has the iCloud integration with Safari. And I don't find that to be satisfactory as much as I find Chrome, the, the, the option to have the, the same tabs you have open on your laptop, move it over to your tablet right away, it's almost like an Android gateway drug. You're like, hey, that's pretty good. It could be better, couldn't it, if I tried another device? All right. This episode of Tech News Today brought to you by Pond5, the world's stock media marketplace. We've been telling you about it all week. If you're a blogger, if you're a filmmaker, if you make websites, if you make podcasts, any type of media you can think of, you're always looking for those elements. You're like, I need that perfect illustration for this blog post. Or, I, I, you know what? I wish I had some sound effects that I knew were safe to use. Nobody's going to come after me. I'm not going to get a takedown notice because I use somebody else's copyrighted work without permission. They, uh, photos, vector illustrations, uh, music tracks. You want some opening and closing music for a podcast, motion graphic templates. All those creative assets are available on Pond5 in a huge library where you can get establishing shots of Chicago, time-lapse videos of Tokyo, 
aerial views of penguins, audio of a ticking bomb, anything you can think of. Go to Pond5. Just do this for me right now. Go to pond5.com and search for whatever comes off your mind. Now, somebody yesterday called me on that. They're like, you know what? I searched for Teletubbies. And I didn't find Teletubbies. Well, they don't have the copyrighted stuff. This is for your own creative work. Uh, so, so think of things that aren't already a brand. You're going to find them there. Look at that. We're, we're flying through the city right now. It's amazing. And you get them very affordably, and you get the right to use them in your work. You get that ability to not worry about that part of your work. Also, artists... Uh, Pond5 is a dynamic marketplace where you can upload pro-quality content, set your own prices, and receive industry-leading royalties on every sale. So if you're a media murker working... A media murker. If you're a murder... <laughs> if you're a media baker working with videos, images, or sounds, go right now to Pond5.com. Use this code. 25% off your purchase this month when you use the coupon code TWIT25. That's Pond5.com. Use that code TWIT25. And we thank Pond5 for their support of Tech News Today. All right, let's talk about that Google Drive announcement. Google announced that uh, they are going to allow Google Drive as an app on iOS. And as previously promised, they're bringing, bringing Google Drive to Chrome OS. Hey, this is great. Now I can edit all my docs and spreadsheets on iOS and Chrome OS. Did you get a different app than I did? No, I didn't. You can't edit anything on the <laughs> iOS app. You can't on the Chrome OS app. Uh, but no iOS is just a viewer. If you want to edit it, you have to hit the send button in the upper right and send it to Safari and edit it there. And in fact, if you send it to anything else like Evernote or, or Box or something, you won't be able to edit it there either because it only sends a PDF version of your doc. Uh, a little bit hamstrung on the iOS side, especially when you consider the other big announcement is that Google Docs word processing now has offline editing, which is great on the desktop and the laptop, right? Because now I can save a doc locally through Google Drive. And if I'm on an airplane or I'm away from the internet, I can still edit it. And when I go back online, it will sync that change up and, and, uh, and, and reconcile it with the version that's up there. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited about all this stuff, except they're not doing what I need. I need. First, I need spreadsheets offline. And I need to be able to edit in that freaking iOS app. Does this I mean, bother anybody else, John? Uh, iOS, not so much because I use Android devices. But uh, see, uh, the, that's what they're trying to do. They're trying to say, "Look, Merritt, you should be using an Android device for this stuff." <laughs> you ordered a Nexus the, Seven. The 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 offline editing is great. I'm glad that's back because, of course, Google Gears had offline editing for a while, but it was not a very strong implementation. It was a lot of problems with it. So it's nice to see that come back. Uh, it's very useful for me. So I'm happy for that. Um, the iOS thing is a big problem. I'm, it, I'm almost wondering, left wondering why even release the app if it's that, you know, hamstrung. Like you said, it's just not, I can't imagine a use for it other than just pulling something up to show someone really quickly, but you can't make any changes or, uh, it, it's just not, I, I don't see the benefit of using that as opposed to navigating through Safari. Yeah, I mean, it definitely seems like it's, it should be called Google Drive Viewer. I mean, it's not it's not something you can use very often. I mean, it does show changes, I guess, not, not in real time, but I'm looking at the spreadsheet application or the, a spreadsheet in it, and it definitely handles tabs a lot better than the uh, the UI on the web in, in the web interface. The web interface for spreadsheets, and we use the spreadsheet on this show very often for the lineup. It looks like it looks awful on uh, when you have a lot of different sheets on on the web. But on the viewer, it's actually not so bad. But it, the, the lack of editing, again, it just seems like Google saying, okay, we got this product. It's ready. We'll put it out now. And maybe when we actually uh, we have a way to do editing right, maybe that's what they're waiting for. Because editing on the web is awful. Maybe they're actually waiting to have a good editing experience for once instead of having a crappy one in its own separate app. The other uh, cloud-related announcement that Google made today was the Google Compute Engine, a cloud service offering for large-scale Linux virtual machines coming out now in limited beta. Uh, Compute Engine offers up to 50% more compute power per dollar than competing infrastructure as a service offerings. This is a big enterprise thing, obviously. Uh, they didn't get into the pricing because that's complex. But if you have an application with low bandwidth and low I.O. requests uh, requirements, you can take advantage of hundreds of thousands of cores and the big wow moment was when they showed 
a genetic application, which on the thousand core machine that systems biology had moved off of took 10 minutes for a line to appear. And, and of course, on the Google Compute Engine, because it's got hundreds of thousands of cores. I think they said they were using 600,000 cores. It was instant. You just click, 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 and the lines come up uh, immediately. So if you're, you're into that kind of enterprise-level computing, this is something very much of interest. No Windows virtual machines, though, only Linux, and I didn't see any details yet about what versions of Linux, although I, I'm sure those are out there. Are you guys impressed by this demo? Other than the fact that it seems like it's another stab at Amazon. I mean, Google seems like they are taking on Amazon on the tablet front and on this on this front saying, look, we got a lot of services. We can do this. So why not? Google just has like an infinite amount of money. And they just I don't know what else they're going to do next. Because, I mean, what, what business well, they are they have not in? A, yeah, they have a huge infrastructure. It seems perfect for them to try to take on Amazon in some of these areas. Don't you think, John? Oh, definitely. Yeah, I mean, Google's been interested in cloud computing for years. And this is just a way of them opening up their expertise and what they've developed at Google for Google uh, to open it up to other customers. And that's that's good business. I mean, it makes sense from a business standpoint. Uh, from a technolo technology standpoint, I just love this. This sort of stuff is what really gets me excited about the idea of using virtual machines, using multiple cores to tackle various problems, looking at really massively parallel problems and using uh, computers to solve those. To me, that's that's the most exciting part of where we are right now as far as technology goes, because we're able to tackle things that just five years ago would have required the most powerful supercomputer in the world, you know, a year's worth of time of computing to get close to to accomplishing. So this is really interesting to me. Uh, let's wrap up with a few other Google notes. Uh, Google TV did get some new stuff. It just wasn't mentioned in the keynote. It's not much, though. An updated Google Play Store is coming that supports purchasing music, movies, TV, and subscription billing. So some in-app sort of stuff, subscription payments. Uh, later this year, Google TV will no longer require hardware manufacturers to provide a physical keyboard on their input device either. So that implies there might be some sort of voice recognition coming down the line uh, from Google TV. And there were a lot of apps in addition to that uh, SiriusXM one that we mentioned yesterday. A bunch of other apps are out now coming down the pike for Google TV. So not a lot going on. New hardware from LG, Sony, and Vizio. We already knew about that. Uh, that's probably why it wasn't in the keynote. And uh, in some discussions off the stage, uh, Google... Uh, and uh, Google's ASUS uh, chief and Sunny Shea and Andy Rubin, the head of the Android project, were talking to some reporters at All Things D, Ina Fried. She's been on the show before. Google apparently told ASUS they had four months to build the Nexus 7. <laughs> like, and, and, and ASUS just put their nose to the grindstone and made it happen. And then when they asked Rubin how, how he were able to sell it for so cheap, because this is a pretty high-quality tablet that is priced the same as the Kindle Fire, which... Is, is at least a year or two years old hardware, comparatively speaking. Ruben told All Things D, when it gets sold through the Play Store, there's no margin. It just basically gets sold through. They're essentially, it sounds like, selling it at cost. Does that surprise you, John? Not really. Uh, I, think, I think a lot of people at Google might be just as frustrated as a lot of consumers are at the fact that if you go out and you buy an Android product, unless it's one of a, a small number you know that you're going to be stuck with an old operating system longer than you should be because it's just of multiple problems. It all depends upon carriers and uh, manufacturers, things like that. So I think this makes sense. Google wants to be able to show off its, its work, its Android operating system, uh, in a way that people can get, can get it without having to worry about those barriers being up in place. And this is possibly the only way of doing it it's the way that you know apple went from the very get-go and it turned out to be a very effective way of getting word out about the quality of a product if everyone is out there using various versions of android then that word never really spreads because no one's telling the same story yeah and with google setting up all that content all their content deals and having the play store with you know purchasing movies and having subscription billing and adding all these features that allows the device to be a gateway to keep buying things, that's the way they can get away with this. Now, if, if, if Google hadn't put all that stuff in place at, at the beginning of the year, if they hadn't done that, there's no way 
they would be able to take this kind of hit or to sell it at cost because that was Amazon's strategy. They were selling the Kindle Fire at a loss because they expected you to continue to purchase content. You would have this long-running bill thanks to your Kindle Fire. And now that Google Play is there, I mean, they're becoming somewhat of a, a monster when it comes to content. You'll be able to keep buying stuff on it. So if they can, if, if Google's actually breaking even, they're beating Amazon again on their first tablet. Well, and Google's idea, the reason they have Android as, a, as an open source operating system is if you use their stuff, you use Google to do searches. And when you use Google to do searches, you, you, you see the ads. And that's how they make their money. They make the majority of their money off ads. So they do have something else in there in addition to yeah. what Amazon can pack in that Amazon doesn't have yet. And I, and I think that that's got to be figured in the equation as well. Let's let's talk about Amazon though. I as uh, there Bloom, there's a Bloomberg story that's starting to take a look at what Amazon's response to all of this might be. Yeah, Amazon's striking back. Now, Bloomberg saying that Amazon is bringing social no! <laughs> Amazon's bringing social gaming features to the fire by releasing tools to game makers by the end of July. It's going to be something like Apple's Game Center. You're going to have achievements and leaderboards and that kind of thing is supposed to help the Kindle Fire. But there's an interesting story out of Boy Genius Reports uh, bringing back that rumor of that 10-inch Amazon Kindle Fire tablet. It was codenamed, I think, Hollywood. This device would have a you know, 10-inch display, quad-core processor, and it would also join a revamped 7-inch Kindle Fire that we talked about the other day. Tablets are supposed to be thinner than the first-generation iPad, no buttons on the front, micro USB, and another jack on these devices that could be HDMI out. The 10-inch would even include a front-facing camera for once. So do, do we think that social gaming is the thing that's going to fight off the Nexus 7, John? Do you think that's the way that that's going to make it a big differentiator? Or is that just kind of adding a little bit more to a kind of a an aging product? An aging product? A fire. <laughs> oh, man, I remember when that Kindle fire came out and dinosaurs roamed the earth. Uh, no, I, I don't. I think really it is more the second category. I think it is more of a just an incremental addition to the Fire's features because uh, while leaderboards and achievements are great and I think they do drive engagement among a certain percentage of gamers out there, I don't think that's going to be the killer feature that people, when looking at both a Kindle Fire and a Nexus 7, will say, oh, wait, there's achievements and leaderboards on this one. I'm going to get this one instead. Uh, that being said, I love things like that. I mean, I love playing games where I can uh, I can I can try and achieve things, get a get an achievement. I love Xbox for that reason. Uh, so I mean, while I enjoy it, I just don't think it's going to be something that's going to be you know, for, uh, foremost in the minds of people who are buying a tablet. And this 10-inch tablet rumor, do we buy, do we buy it? Do we think it's coming out? I mean, this this seems I pretty it. obvious. Yeah, I, th I, th I think Amazon has to venture out into other models, and that's where they've gone before with the Kindle. They come out with their, their signature model, and then they start to differentiate. And I think one of the easiest ways to differentiate is to come up with larger screen size. That, that is the, the biggest selling tablet is a 10-inch tablet. So I wouldn't be surprised at all to see that. Uh, I, I do wonder about this gaming as, as a focus, and we've seen this in every announcement this month. WWDC... Windows Phone Developer Summit, the Microsoft Surface, and Google I.O. all talked about gaming on their platform. And I get why, right? Because everybody wants to have nice gaming. But I almost feel like it's overemphasized. Unless I am a gamer, and that's a very healthy chunk of the market, uh, I'm not as interested. I, I'm playing things like, you know... Uh, I don't know what tiny tower or or something like that. You know, I'm not I'm not interested in these first person shooters. And I wonder if the people who are really into the first person shooters want to play them on a tablet. Well, Tom, you got to remember also that that the the companies that are making standalone handheld gaming consoles are absolutely terrified about smartphones and tablets because it has started to. Uh, take a hit uh, out of their, yeah. their they, they can see their revenues dropping because people are spending that money on getting things like tablets and smartphones that can do lots of different stuff. Uh, it may not be able to give the full experience of what you would expect from a dedicated handhold gaming console, but that's slowly changing. And I think that's the message that all of these companies are trying to put out there. They're saying, hey, you know, we're not that far away from that experience. Now, whether or not you believe that message is entirely different, but I think that's what they're, they're trying to stress. They say, look at this. You know, this trend is really exciting to us. We need to keep on top of that. I guess I just, I'm going to play Pocket Planes, which may, I have some planes to, to schedule, actually, uh, on, my, on my phone and my tablet, and I'm going to play Portal and SimCity on my desktop 
or my laptop. You know, I'm not, I'm, I just, I don't know. I, I get why the video game companies are worried because it's stealing a chunk, but it's not, it's not the be all and end all. It is a great way to show off what your hardware can do though. And I think, I think that's pretty impressive. To get off my lawn. All right, let's move to the <laughs> randomizer. Randomizer. Lasers and lightning bolts to explode things. Like Need Avengers I say movie? more? Sounds like the Avengers movie to me. I will anyway. Uh, scientists and engineers at the Picatinny Arsenal are developing a device that will shoot lightning bolts down laser beams to destroy targets. The laser-induced plasma channel, or LIPC, is designed to take out targets that conduct electricity better than the air or ground. If a laser beam is intense enough, its electromagnetic field can rip electrons off of air molecules and create a plasma. And if they can keep that laser at a filament level... Uh, the plasma is located right along the path of the laser beam, and you can direct it wherever you want by moving a mirror. And the idea being when it finds something conductive, it will then send that, uh, that plasma as sort of a, as a, as a lightning bolt into mm -hmm. that thing. And if it's ordnance, it, it blows it up. John, it, this, this seems like an awesome thing for you guys to write about on how stuff works. Funny you should mention that, Tom. Why, just, uh, just last week, in fact, I recorded a podcast with my co-host about non-lethal uh, weaponry, and one of them uh, was about a, a thing called the portal denial system, which is this – it works on the same principle. And what that is – I thought you that was set just about DRM. Also true. Uh, but this is something you set up in a corridor where you have a series of these lasers pointing from one side of the corridor to the other, so across the hallway. And it creates this plasma channel. You know, you send this very high-energy laser across. It ionizes the, the air between the one side of the corridor and the other. And then they uh, shoot a, a charge of electricity across this channel. And because you've got that ionized gas, it can conduct electricity much better than regular atmosphere could, and you end up getting these z lightning zaps that go across the corridor. So what this weapon is, is the same thing, but, uh, well, it's, it's big daddy sized. Uh huh. Yeah. yeah. And it, and, and it comes from above like Thor. I think that was, that was your yes. first reaction. I as it should be called Thor project Thor or like Palpatine. It should be something <laughs> where you're just shooting lightning bolts. I mean, that's what yeah. this looks like. That looks terrifying. Absolutely terrifying. <laughs> All right, let's see what's coming up on the calendar. Happy Tau Day, everybody. I said Tau, not towel. Tau is double everybody pie. freaked out when I did the week ahead. They're like, you said Pal Day. Tau Day was last year. It was in May. Oh. No, Tau, T-A-U. And a happy Tom Day. It's, it's Tom's birthday. Happy birthday, Tom. Starting tomorrow, okay. June 29th, Sprint's Virgin Mobile will get the Apple iPhone with prepaid plans that start at $30 a month. No subsidies on these phones. It's going to cost you 650 bucks for the 16-gigabyte iPhone 4S or 549 bucks for the iPhone 4. And Guild Wars 2 will launch on August 28th. Ooh, I know a lot of people are looking forward to the Guild Wars launch. Let's see what's incoming. Incoming message. It's always a message, but I like to see anyway, just in case. Uh, this time it's a message. It's always a different message from Alex about that Google Q, the Nexus Q streaming device. Hi, this is Alex. About the Q... Uh, the Nexus Q, not the, you know, the other Q. Uh, the reason because it's $300 and not uh, $100 like other media streamer is because it's not a media streamer alone. It has a high quality amplifier built in it. So you don't need to hook up to your uh, stereo and then to your speakers. You just connect the speakers to it. And that's why it's a little more expensive. Thanks. Yeah, this is a, this is a good point, and we 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 did we glossed over it. We didn't miss it, but it, it's a, a good emphasis that Alex is making. That they kept saying you hook this up to the best speakers in your house, and Leo and I were giving them a little funny like, well, you know, you, you only hook it up to your best speakers. What about your worst speakers? But the reason they were saying that is because of a high quality amplifier, which they did talk about. Uh, and so this is a higher quality piece of audio machinery. Maybe the, the negative reaction to it is caused less by the functionality and the price of the object itself and more by the fact that we're the MP3 generation. And a lot of us uh, Philistines with tin ears don't care about audio quality anymore. Do you think that could be true, John? I, I think I just died inside a little bit. I, um, I, yeah, I know. I've got my vinyl 
set up right over there, actually. Uh, yeah, no, I, I do agree. I think, uh, I think that is part of it. Also, part of it is just that I think when most people were looking at it, they didn't realize that, you know, they heard about you plug it into your speakers. But I think a lot of people thought, oh, you plug this into your uh, sound system, which is then plugged into your speakers. And another issue I have is that if you already have a sound system, then buying something like this is kind of questionable anyway. I mean, you're already thinking like, well, but I already have a nice sound system. Why would I replace it with with this, even though it has that connectivity? Uh, I could get a, a different device that has connectivity that doesn't replace my sound system. It enhances it, and it's less expensive. And then people... And it's, it's not bringing you the high-quality tracks, right, Ayaz? Well, yeah, that, I mean, because it's, it's pulling from the clouds using Google Music. And I think one of the things is that people have been uh, mistakenly comparing this to something like an Apple TV or even a Google TV because this device... It, it doesn't necessarily fit any one characteristic. It's like a Sonos that has an HDMI out, and that doesn't really make a lot of sense to a lot of people because this it's actually it's almost on a class by itself. It's not exactly – there's no direct competitor for this. It just seems to do a little bit of everything. Yeah, and, and uh, sometimes that's a bad thing. If you do a little bit of everything, people don't really understand what you do right mm -hmm. at all. Uh, ben in Nova Scotia sent us an email pointing out that the Nexus 7 is available in multiple countries and the Kindle Fire is not. And so he can already uh, or pre-order it in Canada. It's also available in the UK and Australia. It's certainly not worldwide, but already it's available in more markets than the Kindle Fire was. Uh, I, I think that is another advantage the Nexus 7 could have here. Yeah, two hundred dollars and impressive specs and a larger availability. Amazon's got to get get moving really fast. Mm -hmm. Well, that's it for this edition of Tech News today. Don't forget our new time starts on Monday. Uh, we've got a crazy schedule going on. I'm going to be gone tomorrow because I have to go to this conference in Anaheim. So I, as and Darren Kitchen, are holding down the fort with Randall Bennett. Uh, and then on Monday, I as and I come in and do the show at 10 a.m. Mm -hmm. uh, for our for our new time. We do that Monday and Tuesday. Wednesday we're off because of Independence Day holiday in the United States. Then we're back for Thursday and Friday at 10 a.m. And then Sarah Lane finally comes back the Monday following that. That's the ninth, and we're back to having the crew together. At the new time, everything starts to settle down, at least for a while. Uh, but thanks to everybody for being patient with us through all of the transition. Don't forget to submit stories. Let us know what stuff you want to hear at our subreddit, technewstoday.reddit.com. Great place to uh, to see what kind of stuff other people in the audience like as well. And John Strickland, thank you so much. Always great having you on uh, and getting your perspective on stories like this. I, I'm glad we had a lightning bolt laser story for you to sink your teeth <laughs> in, too. I was too. When I saw that uh, as a potential story in the randomizer, I was so happy. Uh, thank you guys so much. I always enjoy coming on. And let folks know where they can find, uh, not well, HowStuffWorks.com, obviously, uh, to find stuff, but also the Tech Stuff podcast. Sure, yeah. Uh, Tech Stuff is available on everything from your iPod to your Zoom. We actually had a Zoom listener write us the other day and tell us about his experience listening to the show. Uh, it, and we have a Tech Stuff RSS feed as well. You can go to HowStuffWorks.com. We have links to all the different podcasts that we put out. And uh, mine is just one of a vast army of awesome podcasts. So check them out. Absolutely. Thanks, everybody, for watching or listening. You can find us on the web, twit.tv slash TNT. You can email us. Our email address is TNT at twit.tv. Give us a call. Leave us a voicemail. Our phone number is 260-TNT-SHOW. Or you can record it as an MP3 and attach it and send it along. Darren Kitchen and Randall Bennett will join Ayaz Akhtar for TNT tomorrow. They'll see you then. I'll see you Monday. Have a great weekend, everybody.